This podcast is sponsored by Bigger Brains, online training that won't bore you to tears. Expand the minds of your workforce at getbiggerbrains.com. Welcome to Permission to Speak, the video blog and podcast that loiters at the intersection of leaders who want their people to speak up, technology that facilitates connections, and results that serve our higher purpose. Now, here's your host, Kelly Vandiver. Hi, welcome to the podcast. This is Kelly Vandiver, and my special guest today is Dr. Philip Kim. Phil is an educator, speaker, consultant, author, and business professor at Walsh University. We'll be talking today about his latest book, Zebras and Ostriches, Five Simple Rules to Engage and Retain Your Best Employees. Phil is also, also the author of two more books, Big Business Problems, Small Business Solutions, and Chase One Rabbit, 10 Habits That Move You from Failure to Success. He's also been published in over 20 academic journals. Phil is the son of first-generation Korean immigrants, and he grew up working in the family businesses. After overcoming some academic hurdles, Phil also went on to become the vice president of information security for a multi-billion dollar financial services organization. So welcome, Phil, to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, for having me. As you know, we like to start with a couple of quirky questions to get to know our guest before we get into the meat of the conversation. And my first quirky question for you is, tell us what is your guilty pleasure television show? Mm, all right. Well, I I have plenty. But, uh, <laughs> the uh, the one that immediately comes to mind uh, is or are, are any cooking shows. So any reality TV cooking shows that involve somebody cooking food and then competing against another person cooking food and the judges either rip somebody apart or they say that they love I love it any anything Gordon Ramsay um, there's a show called chopped uh, I, it, that's like my ultimate uh, guilty pleasure love but it. it has to have food and competition are those both <laughs> elements or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I've, I've I've sort of graduated to the point where I need some level of competition. If it's just a cooking <laughs> show, it's, it's I'm wondering when somebody's going to get booted off. So yeah, at, at this point, it's it's both. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Oop, I'm getting, I'm a, little getting echo. a little echo. Oh, I'm okay on my end. Okay, that's better. That's there better. we go. Yeah. Oh, we'll just we'll just mu- we'll muscle through it. Hopefully, it'll okay. be, won't be too bad. Uh, second quirky question: uh, What actor would you want to play you in a movie? Mm. So this is a this, this sort of a, a twist on that answer because I've been asked that question before, and this isn't any type of I'm not making any type of political stance or anything, but there aren't many um, Asian movie stars, at least in American uh, films. So I'll go to TV. And this guy isn't Asian either, but he's my favorite actor of all time, <laughs> um, is Jerry Seinfeld. So I would love it if Seinfeld or any of his uh, castmates were to play me in, in a show, or if I could play one of, uh, if I could be a cast member on, on Seinfeld, that would have been the ultimate <laughs> I, I love that show. Just a real big fan of the show, huh? Yeah. In fact, I'm listening to a book right now called Seinfeldia. Um, it just was one of those books you're looking for something to, to listen to on long car trips, and I happened to find it at our local library. And it's the ultimate fanboy book. So if you're really – or fangirl, as it were. If you're into Seinfeld, there's a book recommendation, Seinfeld. Yeah, it goes into the backstory and the history of how the show came to be, all the side characters. It's It's phenomenal. So is it anything like – in the actual show where they say let's do a show about nothing is it it's... yeah absolutely yeah so it's very meta it sort of gets into how this show started and how it really was about nothing and it actually had an insight that i, I didn't realize and I, i'm not sure if you're familiar with the show but I'm, I'm i'm assuming your your listeners at least will be um there the author had said the reason why we like the show so much is because these four characters, they run into everyday situations and they respond in a way that we would like to respond <laughs> if we didn't have 
sort of social moorings <laughs> tying us down. So I, I, that was an epiphany for me. I thought that is the way I would want to respond if I didn't have any responsibilities <laughs> whatsoever. So, great That's insight. funny. Yeah. yeah, I heard somewhere that one of the tenets of their writing was that the the characters could not learn a lesson. They could That's not right. like right. and, 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 like make yeah. better choices in life because That's of right. their life experience. <laughs> That's right. In fact, there's a there's a line that Larry David said. It says no hugging and no learning. So there was no yeah, there's no redemption and there's no sentimental value to it whatsoever. It's fantastic. <laughs> very funny. Very good. All right. And now for something a little more serious. Um, sure. so, so what is your story? What happened in your life that got you to a place where you cared about employees being engaged and having a voice? Well, yeah, that's a that's a really good good question. I know that's sort of that's the the main uh, theme of this interview. Um, you know, for me, it, it was a very uh, sort of stark event. I uh, up until about two thousand and let's see, I graduated school right around Y two K. So I was working for uh, financial service institutions. Going around, I started off in IT audit for um, local CPA uh, and consulting firm. And in the CPA world, you, you, either, um, you either give your blood, sweat, and tears for 10 plus, year in, uh, 10 plus years and you make partner, or you get hired by one of your client banks. So that's what I did. I got hired by one of my client banks, sort of moved up the ranks. Um, I got recruited to my dream job. It was uh, to be essentially the VP of information security for a very well-respected company uh, in my in my local town. So in my first 90 days, I have my review with my first boss, and uh, she said three things to me. She said, Phil, I want you to know that uh, you weren't my first choice, number one. And then number two, um, I think that your work is – well, basically she said, I've seen your work, and any monkey can do what you do. And um, – Basically, I'm going to be watching you like a hawk. And it was almost as if I felt like I was being punked. Like I was looking around for the for the cameras and I thought, what is going on? So I went straight to HR and thankfully uh, the HR professional was very professional. And she said, you know, that was inappropriate. We'll we'll deal with it. And they allowed me to uh, post uh, an IJP, which is an internal job posting um uh, immediately. So the normal protocol was you have to wait six months before you can post for an IJP. But after 90 days, they said that I could do it. Um, I was moved laterally to a different department and, and it ended up being okay. Um, but I recall, um, that I thought my days here are numbered, um, not because of my work, but the fact that I did not have any trust in my immediate supervisor. So the old saying is true that people, will join organizations, but they'll leave a boss. Um, that was definitely true in my in my experience. So that's what impacted me. Wow. What What is even going on in a person's head that would say something like that? Yeah, you know, and honestly, I, I wish I knew. There, there were some other underlying issues that I had no clue about with that particular person. Um, and she eventually was uh, forced to resign after 25 years. So I think this was her 25th year. Um, so I don't know if I was just the straw that broke her back or what, mm -hmm. but she definitely laid it out um, on me. And I thought, wow, this is uh, I made the wrong move. But it, it all worked out in the end. But again, that really did leave an impact in my 10 plus years before that. Kelly, I thought this is great. If you just work hard, put your nose to the grindstone, you're going to get what you deserve. But I realized um, sometimes bad bosses really do make a huge difference in people's lives. So, And so now part of what you do is to help other bosses not be like that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, not only with my students, because I'm a full-time professor, um, I, I, I conduct about 20 to 25 workshops in a year. Um, and I help uh, leaders and emerging leaders to become better leaders so they don't have those experiences exactly. Good, good. All right. Well, let's uh, move into talking about your book a little bit. I guess the first question needs to be, why zebras and ostriches? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the classic question. Um, so this was uh, news to me, but as I was researching different um, concepts within I, 
I'm a big fan of nature. So I like not only cooking shows, but I like nature <laughs> shows too. And any, any type of documentary uh, involving sort of the animal kingdom. And I ran into one and it, I, I can't find it again, but I know that there's other research that, that supports this, but the idea of symbiotic relationships. So the, the, the documentary went into how zebras and ostriches, how they travel together in pods in the African, in the African plains. And the reason why that is, is because zebras have a really keen sense of hearing and of smell. And um, ostriches can't smell or hear, but they have a bird's eye view. So whenever they travel together in pods, they're able to look out for predators together. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then I, I thought that would be a really interesting twist on how organizations work together. So all of our organizations, our departments, and people that we work with, we're all differing levels of zebras and ostriches. <laughs> and we really need to work together to, to work on our strengths and to overcome our weaknesses. Very good. Very good. And, and I knew that because I read the book, but <laughs> <laughs> I figured folks listening would be curious. Sure. Too. Yep. All righty. Well, one of the things that I really, uh, really stood out for me in in reading your book, and I and I feel like it's different than a lot of what um, I've read, even when you're talking about engaging employees or inspiring them. You, you said um, that to inspire employees, you need to give them projects or problems that have real significance and purpose, and mm -hmm. that you need to delegate projects that are meaningful to the s success of the organization. That that's a pretty strong way to, to phrase that. So tell us what's behind those statements and, and why you feel like that's important for managers to understand and to do. Sure. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, and again, varying levels of engagement uh, that we're talking about, right? So when you first start off, of course, you kind of have to go through um, the, the policies and procedures and here's how we do things at this organization. And that, that I, I don't mean to sort of discount that. But at a certain point, for most organizations, the reason why their employees aren't engaged, one of the one of the top reasons, I believe, other than building a solid core of trust, is the sense of what am I contributing to the organization? Am I just here's the analogy that I use. So when I, I have three uh, children, so and they are 12, 10 and three. I got that right. Okay. Um, but so I'm thinking of our three-year-old, Andrew. He loves to cook. He loves to – every time I'm cooking something, I like it too, and he likes watching me do it. But he says, Daddy, can I help? It's like, yeah, okay. So of course I'm giving him stuff like, hey, can you uh, uh, arrange the paper clips up <laughs> in the other room you know, or can you make sure that the spoons are all lined up? Well, eventually he gets to the point he's like, no, I really want to help. I want to help you. And, you know, so he gets in there and he's making a mess and he's, you know, it's it's more work for me, to be honest, but it does engage him to the level where he's really watching what he's doing. He's learning by observing and he's learning by doing. And I thought, isn't that true of us, too, where we really want to have projects and things that we can feel like we're making a con contribution? We don't want to just line up spoons or organize paper clips. We want right. to have a meaningful contribution. Um, and then I say, if you can align your individual goals to organizational success, so aligning individual goals to organizational success, then you're going to have an engaged workforce. So that's that's the challenge where you can really almost increase the vision of your workers to the point where, hey, this little bit that I'm doing actually means something to the end product. So we're all siloed. So it's it's really sort of expanding that silo to include, you know, to, to basically educate your employees that what you're doing matters, even if it's a small job and it matters to the end product. But it's hard for managers to let go oh, of that. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, it's easier and the, the way that you said it exactly right. But it's – um. It's so much easier just to be like, and especially if somebody doesn't do it right the first time, it, it's so much easier to say, don't worry about it. I got it. And you marginalize them to the point where they, they don't really feel like they're contributing. So, yeah, yeah, that's that's a tough one. 
but it's a great point. I mean, it really does make a difference if you you get such better results. And guess what? If you're if you're a good leader, it's okay if your employees end up being better at you than you Absolutely. at some things. You know, it makes it better for you all the all of all around. So yeah, and I think it's also just a broader conversation. You know, if it's if if your employees are constantly thinking, well, see, the opposite of that is if the employees constantly think, well, that's not my job. So that's the opposite, where they're just saying, well, I'm just going to do this because I get paid for this. That's what I'm doing, and that's what I'm going to do really well. And God bless them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have an engaged workforce. You're going to have a workforce that is doing what they're paid to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Very, good. Very good. Well, one of the things that you uh, also state in the book is that engagement is a two-way street. Uh, can you explain what you you mean by that? Yeah, yeah. So often what I see is, well, Phil, I told them what to do, and it was pretty clear to me, <laughs> and uh, I just don't understand why my workers can't do what I expect them to do. I mean, I did it when I was in their position, and I think gone are those days where it's this sort of chain of command communication where it's top down. All right. Uh, this is what the boss says, and that's that's what that's what we're gonna do because that's what the C level person said. And I I just don't think that works anymore. I think we live in a world where organizations are uh, becoming more flat, and accessibility is a huge huge issue for. And I don't want to just say millennials because that term is thrown around. I think we've all just. Uh, sort of readjusted what our expectation is in terms of a two-way street, a two-way communication. So when you tell me to do something, or rather when you ask me to do something, I'm going to ask you some challenging questions. Well, could we do it this way? Or how come we don't do it this way? And you as the leader have to have thick enough skin, I guess, to accept that communication and engagement really should be a two-way street. It's a conversation as opposed to just a one-way, you know, here, thou shalt do this. Exactly, exactly. And I love that you made that point. Um, Mm -hmm. You used an example in the book with uh, one of your uh, sons, I think, (laughs) that I thought was <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So my uh, at this point, I want to say Sammy, my second son, was six years old, and I was working on something. You know, just like any good American dad, I'm multitasking or parent. <laughs> I'm multitasking. I have eight windows open. I'm late on four different emails. So he comes into my office and he's like, "Dad, can we talk?" I'm thinking, "No, that's the last thing I want to do." But of course, I let him sit down. And I'm trying to work as he's talking to me. I'm just giving him road answers. Yeah, uh uh-huh, yeah, what does your mom say, whatever. Um, And then at the end of, literally, it was probably like a five-minute conversation, which is a long time with a (laughs) six-year-old. He gets up and he says, thanks, Dad, you're the best. And I'm thinking, what? What? What did I? What just happened? <laughs> he, he runs upstairs to his older brother and he says, "He said yes." So now I'm worried. So I run up and I'm thinking, "What did I just say yes to?" And here they had already had these drawings and renderings of sort of like this. Uh, if you've ever seen American Ninja Warrior, which is basically like an obstacle course on speed, um, they had uh, they had all these traps and booby traps, knives, a fire pit, just completely dangerous obstacle course and they mapped it out and apparently i had said yes that they can do this as a summer side project so yeah so i he was engaged but i certainly wasn't so yeah it's a two-way street for sure very good very good thanks for sharing that story yeah thanks for bringing it up uh one of the uh acronyms that you use in the the book is uh care and uh, mm-hmm. can, can you explain what what that stood for stands for and and why it's important for leaders as sure to engage yeah I, and it's it's fairly simple but it, so the c in care is to see the person as a complete person so you're not just seeing them as another you know cog in the machine or basically a, a replaceable part because i think people will sense that when you just see them as well, you didn't do this or you, you know, you were late on this. They just you, you get a sense that the boss only sees you as a number. So to care, to see them as a complete person. Um, the other one is to be aware. So the A is awareness. So if 
if you're in a situation where somebody didn't respond to you or perhaps they were late on a project that you really needed, it might not have been because they were lazy. It might be because they had eight other projects that you've asked them to do last week. Or more realistically, maybe somebody in their family got sick or their mother-in-law was at home or what, what have you. So just being aware, again, seeing them as a complete person, being aware of their situation. And the R is to be real. I think we, again, have gone to a place in our lives, especially with the whole sort of conversions of social media and being active on that and where that line is blurred between work life and home life. I think we sh we all realize that people have real lives outside of work and also that we're not all perfect. I think it used to be, even when I was going to school, you wouldn't hear the professors make a mistake. You know, if they were wrong and you called them on it, they would say that the textbook is wrong. Or if you said <laughs> that a parent was wrong, you'd get a backhand to the head. So, you know, being real um, and then experiences. So paying attention to what the employees are good at. So that's the E in in care so complete person being aware seeing them and being a real person and showing your warts and then experiences again sh seeing where your employees are really good because i think if you are able to see that then you can focus on uh harnessing their strengths as opposed to trying to remediate a weakness which research has shown that that is much more exhausting and much less effective yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly Definitely. So tell me, talk a little more about the, um, the awareness and the, the being real pieces. Um, because I think, uh, that I grew up in, an, I'm older than you. So, uh, so I, I grew up in an era where, you know, you keep your business and your personal separate and that has uh, morphed quite a bit, but I think it's for the, the best. Um, how how have you um, approached the awareness piece, understanding what's going on in people's lives without feeling like they're feeling like they're being intruded upon or, um, you know, that there's some kind yeah. of line that's been crossed? Yeah, that's a that's a totally valid question. And I think you do in this case, I think you do have to um, pay attention to maybe not follow prescriptively, but you do have to pay attention in terms of what the cultural differences are, either between the generations or cultural differences are, quite frankly, between gender or if you're in, uh, you know, again, not to paint anybody with a broad brush, but being aware and being real with someone may look different in a marketing department for a fortune uh, 100 as opposed to a marketing department in a startup in San Bernardino, California. So I do appreciate that there are cultural differences. Um, but again, I think gone are the days of this, you know, you punch in, you punch out and you give your 40 hours and you get to go home and you never hear from your boss. Like, I don't think that's realistic anymore either. So there is, um, we just had a, um, uh, an interview with the head of entertainment at Twitter because he's a he's a Walsh alum. His name is Jed Tarpey. And he, he even talked about gone are the days of this annual review. He said, I don't do annual reviews. Are you kidding me? If I waited a whole year before my employees heard from me, that they would work for Snapchat or Facebook. They want to hear from me daily, you know. I mean, certainly weekly, but I mean, literally almost every day he's texting one of his employees. Hey, how are things going? How's that project going? Um, and also just not necessarily intruding on people, but just asking regular questions. Hey, we're, we're human beings. If all we talked about was work, you know, it would just be drudgery at work. Right. I mean, there's a. Uh, it's almost like um, it's sort of the opposite of don't talk about religion or politics at the dinner table. I think at the work table, so to speak, if all you talk about is work, you're going to have people who are disengaged. Yeah. So how do you um, recommend or how do you how are you more real with folks as a, in a leadership kind of a role to to be more approachable or to be more human in, in, in front of the folks that you that look up to you or that are in a position um, that looks up to you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think I think, again, this isn't prescriptive, but I think you can start by asking simple questions. Things like, hey, 
um, how, how are things going at home or how are, how have things been? I mean, you can start off real, real nonchalant by talking about the game or weather or what have you, but you can ask even probing questions just like you did. Hey, what's your favorite show? Or, <laughs> you know, what are you reading recently? And then when you get down to, so, are you, so you're building sort of this foundation of mutual understanding and trust. So if I know somebody like Seinfeld, Oh my gosh! At that point, he and I have a connection like that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean that's probably a, a, a sort of a deficiency of mine. I, I almost won't want to talk about anything but Seinfeld with that person. But once we have a solid, uh, a mutual understanding that we have, you know, mutual likes. At that point, if there are challenges or communication issues, um, I, I think as a leader, I've already established that I care about that person beyond just what they produce, right? So at that point, there's already established trust. So now we can get to brass tacks and it doesn't seem like this awkward jump because we've already talked about other stuff. Um, and then also another important aspect I think is to also share with them when you're struggling. So if you have an issue or if you are challenged with this, or if you did at one point, you could say, hey, you know what? I remember that. You know, four years ago when I was working on this, it was killing me. I couldn't do it at all. And here's how I worked around it or here's how my mentor helped me. So I think, again, it's establishing this this rapport through being real and to the point where you can show your flaws as well. Yeah, I think that's really important. It took me a while to learn that one. And I, and I still am <laughs> working on it. But <laughs> Sure. No, I, we all are. It's a process. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. Well, uh, one of the things I did feel like I had to ask you, because in your writing, you're quite funny. I, I'm a, I love to laugh, and I oh, laughed out loud you. more than a few times oh, <laughs> reading your you. book. Oh, oh absolutely. That's the best compliment you could have paid. Thank you. <laughs> well, I guess with the Seinfeld connection, right? You yeah, like right. the humor. <laughs> but uh, do you think humor is, a, is an important element or can be a valuable uh, uh, asset to a leader. I mean, maybe yeah. that's a softball question, but come on. <laughs> no, no, that's, I think, you know what, that is, it seems like an obvious question, but I don't think enough people are asking it. Um, I think it's true of any, uh, any leader, anybody in public office, uh, anybody in, uh, you know, the, I, I'm just trying to think, we just had commencement at Walsh University and we had somebody speaking for, oh, I don't know, 20 plus minutes. And it was good. Don't get me wrong. It was very, you know, uh, uh, a very instructive message, stuff that I didn't know. And he was a, a religious leader. He's an ambassador to the U.S. from uh, from another country. So very impressive credentials. But the thing that struck me was his humor, the 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 things that I remember basically were the things when he was referencing uh, something silly that he had done or something embarrassing that had happened to him. So it was the humor that really that really struck me. I think of all the um, the professors that I've had, all the speakers that I've heard, the ones that I remember, the ones that I talk about for years and years are the ones that incorporate humor. And I, I find that to be true and true again. In fact, now when I listen to speakers, I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting to be, you know, entertain me, but I'm waiting to, to laugh. I'm waiting to be engaged with the truth. And, you know, just that unique spin on on an obvious uh, observation. Yeah. So absolutely. I think it's it's critical. And uh, again, I hate to, to blast on on sort of the millennials and the generation that I'm teaching, but they've almost come to expect it as well. So when you are giving your message or you're teaching or you're giving um, uh, even a serious topic, if you can't incorporate some sort of levity or some sort of humor or, or something into it, I think it just falls flat. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, for sure. So loosen up, leaders out there. <laughs> Have a sense of humor. <laughs> right. And that's the thing. I don't think anybody, you know, nobody is expecting to be the next Jerry Seinfeld or the Louis C.K. We're not stand-up comics. You know, right. we're not telling jokes. It's just, it's life. I've heard another speaker say this, that, um, what is it? Basically, life is a series of either opportunities to cry or to laugh. <laughs> And I, I choose to laugh. Yeah, for sure. Very good. Very good. 
<laughs> Me too. I like the laughter much better. <laughs> All right. Now I'm back to a serious subject. Though. Sure. <laughs> um, one of the things that you talk about in the book is that our brains are wired towards a negative bias. Mm. And with that in mind, I think that uh, leaders have to be conscious of that when they're giving their staff feedback. So can you yeah. discuss what, what that means and, and what implications that has for leaders in giving feedback? Sure. Yeah. Gr- another great question. Um, and by your questions, I can tell that you actually read the book. So I appreciate that. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> I've, had, I've had people that will interview me and say, hey, uh, beyond zebras and ostriches, say, what do you think about this? And I can tell that they didn't read it. So I do appreciate your <laughs> questions. Um, yeah, so the negativity bias um, is it has been a, a study that's been done, I think, several times. But the most recent one was from an article from the Harvard, Harvard Business Review, which basically stated that we as humans are four times more likely – I want to say this right – four times more likely – 80% more likely to remember a negative event in our lives than a positive event. Um, so if you think about it – uh, with all of the things that are going on, it, just the example that it, that I'll say is um, is so when you're traveling somewhere and you uh, get pulled over by a police officer, you know you get a speeding ticket. It may have been two years since your last speeding ticket. This is most of us, hopefully. <laughs> um, but y- immediately what comes to mind is, oh my gosh, I always get a speeding ticket here. Oh, I can't believe this is my unlucky spot. You know, this is, I always get stuck at these stoplights or these red lights, or I always get stuck behind the slow person at, you know, the food store playing, paying with a check instead of, you know, (laughs) instead of cash. So our brains are much more likely to remember negative events and emotions. So it's called the negativity bias. Um, so to your point, when we as managers and leaders were offering feedback to our employees, just keep that in mind. I mean, how many times have you been in an office? Let's say it's your annual performance review, which again, we've said is ineffective, but let's just say you still do them. Uh, you could listen to 20 to 25 minutes of glowing praise, you know, Phil is this and Kelly does this great and she's incredible. Her hair is amazing. (laughs) And then, and then they'll give you one or two sentences about how you might improve. You walk out of there thinking, Oh, I'm the worst person ever. (laughs) Like that's all you think about the, you know, the last two to three minutes of, of this sort of formative feedback. Um, so I like, I, I sort of like the Toastmasters, uh, sandwich technique where you, you know, start with a positive, then you give them some that they can improve on and then you end with a negative. Uh, so that is one strategy. Uh, but if you were to look at the pure numbers, effectively what this research is saying is, believe it or not, you have to consider four to five positive, uh, assessments or four to five positive aspects of your employee to that one negative aspect, if you will. So think of four to five positive sort of confirming and supportive statements and then sandwich that with one sort of formative, here's where you can improve and then you can end it with another positive. So uh, yeah, if you can have a four or five to one ratio, um, that's what the Harvard Business Review is saying uh, is is effective in counteracting the negativity bias. Gotcha, gotcha. Now it's interesting, I... um... Uh, deliver some material for uh, uh, for the American Management Association, and and cool. one one of the uh, recommendations in, in some of that material is that when you're doing a review, start with the negative. Mm, okay. Because even if you're say, starting with a positive, they're they're waiting for the other shoe to drop. That's true. They're, yeah. they're, they know it's coming. They they can't yeah, really focus good. on the positive stuff because they're. You know, they know the They're negative waiting. is coming, right? right <laughs> and I, right. I thought that that was an interesting perspective. And uh, you know, I I like that. I may steal that. I, I will say this just to confirm that whatever you do, I don't think we should end on a negative. That mm-hmm. I will definitely confirm that, regardless of whether you get the ratio right or wrong. Um, you definitely want to end on a positive for yeah, sure. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Very good, very good. Well, one thing that took me aback in your in the in the reading was you reported a very startling statistic about what was even worse than giving negative feedback. Would you mind explaining what what is even worse than negative feedback? 
Right. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> let me let me I guess let me contextualize this. So this is based off the study from from Gallup, the Gallup organization, and they do, you know, an annual uh, assessment of employee engagement. Um, and I think their their study has been around since 1990. It's been over 20 years for sure. So 5 million people have taken these surveys. There's the Q12. What they found was when you when you give positive feedback, the number of engaged employees goes up to 65%, which is phenomenal. If you have a workforce that is actively engaged at a number of 65%, because the norm is about 20 to 30 percent actually for optimal organizations so companies like google uh zappos they're they're in the top you know 20 30 percent when you give act positive engagement those numbers can spike up to over half so over 60 percent now when you give negative feedback it's still formative but it's negative that number drops to about 45 percent so if it goes from 65 percent to 45 percent When you what's surprising to me is when you don't give any feedback at all, that number drops all the way down, all the way down to about two percent. So it's almost negligible. Yeah, it becomes almost zero percent. So actively engaged workforce, 45 percent goes down, drops down to less than about two percent when you don't give any feedback. And, you know, when you really think about it, it's. It's shocking, but it's not surprising. And I I say that because really when you don't give feedback, when you don't give any type of feedback, positive or negative, basically what that communicates to your employees is I don't care about you. Mm -hmm. I don't see you. I have 80 other things that I'd rather be doing. And basically I'm going to ignore you. You are not even worth my time to yell at at this point. You're you're nothing to me. So that that effectively is the story that it goes it drops all the way down to two percent. Yeah, that that was just so startling to me. I, I remember my, well, my first experience was a, as an officer in the Navy, and I remember uh, somebody saying, "You know, the Navy thinks me twice a month." You know, that's because <laughs> that's when we get paid was twice a month. You know, and, <laughs> but that's that's still out there. Maybe yeah. not as prevalent as it was uh, back in the older days, but um, <laughs> but it's still out there, you know. Wow. Well, so. thank you. Thank you for your service. That's wonderful. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm glad you brought that up. It, it's it's even true in the sense where because I, I hear this all the time. It's like, well, you know, Phil, they do their job because they're paid to do their job. And I say, yeah, that's true. So if you want compliance – you know, military like compliance, that's the way to go. Just pay them for the job and let them be on their way. But if you want engagement, we're talking about engagement, creative, creative thinking, uh, problem solving, going beyond just what they're paid for, then we really have to employ some of these strategies. And in your case, obviously you served and, you know, you you served your country. So there's a different motivation there. You're not doing it for the money, obviously. (laughs) You know, Anyone that so, knows the pay scale knows it's yeah, obviously exactly. <laughs> so, but even even in the military now, we want to increase the level of engagement so we can we can you know we can encourage our soldiers to go above and beyond what they're just quote unquote paid to do. So compliance, yes, but if you want engagement, you're going to have to take it a step further. Well, and even thirty years ago when I was in the military. It wasn't about strict compliance either, uh, uh, you know. And they didn't, they they didn't teach us um, in in our leadership classes to just tell them yell louder, you know. That that wasn't. They they talked about coaching and, and a more um, engaged type of uh, experienced. So oh. sorry, I lost you there for a minute. I don't know if you lost yeah. me too. Okay, we're back. Yeah, I did. We're back. <laughs> okay, good, good. All righty. Um, one of the things that. I've recently been reading and I read it in in your book as well is that uh, it's something that I don't know that all leaders understand, but that uh, employees who are engaged, if they're given a choice, if they have that discretional energy that they're willing to spend, but if they're given a choice, they're going to choose an organization that provides training versus an organization that doesn't provide training, All, all other things being equal. Um, but what should a leader do if they don't have a robust training budget? Um, what are some things that 
that you're aware of that we can still do as leaders to help uh, take care of that that need of of people that want to be engaged also want to be developed and trained. Yeah, no, I think that's a it's a it's a challenge. So I know training budgets are going down. Um, well, I mean, actually, I'd say they're on the uptick, but for organizations that historically have not budgeted for that, um, you know, I think the the quick answer to that question is if you again, this is a I, I I'm not sure if I'm going to get this phrase right, but basically, um, if you if you think what is it? If you think training is expensive, <laughs> think about not training them and see what happens. But I guess realistically, if you don't have the budget and you want to do something this year, so it's it's we're in the second quarter of 2017, and you want to incorporate something, you know, at a minimum, I would think you you have an opportunity to do something. Uh, organization within the organization keep it in-house so to speak so you can do lunch and learns um you can do uh masterminds or accountability groups that's what we do here um you can purchase books for everybody and you can start a, a book club i had a um a small group of about 35 uh, employees at fedex they purchased a, a copy of my book and they brought me in i mean they were a local local branch here so i came in for you know for a nominal fee. Um, and, uh, it was really interesting. I almost didn't have to do anything. I just, you know, I was there for 45 minutes. I did a Q and a, um, and they really drew more insights from the book than I even did. So it was sort of like I was taking <laughs> notes. Um, so yeah, so I think there's some, some informal ways that you can do this. I don't think it has to be this robust. I, I liked what you said about that. Uh, cause I think it can be discouraging if you don't have, you know, tens, 20, hundred thousands of dollars for, for training. But, um, I think when managers take it upon themselves to think creatively about how they can build into their employees, um, that says a lot. That says a lot about the, the person that you work for, the team that you work with, um, and it certainly breeds a sense of loyalty. And you think I, I'm th I'm in a place where I'm growing. I'm in a place where all things being equal, I'm not going to leave this place um, for another gig just because um, you know I get a corner office or what have you. I mean, again, all things being equal, um, if you're making a livable wage and uh, you have jobs or um, you're given jobs with that have some sort of significance to the organization and your boss is really building into your career, I can't imagine a better place to work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good, good. All righty. So what are some other ways that leaders can encourage innovation and, and getting their employees to, to speak up? Well, you know, I, we just had this um, actually at our organization where we had these, um, uh, for for lack of a better term, uh, committees. So they, you know, everything's been, uh, you know, committed to death. But, <laughs> you know, so we, we have, um, we actually have a committee on who we're going to give an honorary degree to at Walsh University. We have a degree or we have a committee on um, what faculty awards are going to be distributed. So it's like fun, fun stuff like that. And we usually get a bunch of volunteers to do that kind of stuff because it's really I mean, it's meaningful and it's important, but it's also a level of uh, engagement and creativity that you probably wouldn't get if you're in the, I don't know, assessment committee or something, <laughs> something a bit more taxing, so to speak. Um, so I think that could be a model for organizations where you will ask. And that's the other thing. I guess I should have started with that. Um, you know, managers and leaders that don't ask are the ones that seem to complain a lot. You know, the, the, well, nobody's volunteering and nobody's stepping up. I think, well, have you asked? Right. I mean, they might they might be dying to do something, but they don't want to be seen as the brown noser or they don't want to be seen as somebody who um, is stepping on your toes or questioning mm -hmm. your authority. Right. So I I put it on them. I say, hey, have you asked? I would say, hey, uh, I would love to get a team uh, to, to work on a problem that we've been having with our, you know, customer database, you know, our CRM system is crap. We need a new one. 
I need somebody from marketing, but I also need somebody from sales and I need somebody from logistics to come every Thursday. Let's just whiteboard this out. So I, I think there are some creative ways that you can get your employees to help you solve some big, hairy and sticky problems. But you need to ask first. So I think that's that's number one. Um, I think there should be what we call uh, we call them uh, FLCs, so faculty learning communities. But that could be anything. It could be engineering learning communities. It could be sales learning. It could be you know customer service learning communities. What have you? Um, I think if you bring people together, get them some pizza, and you provide an opportunity for them to start chatting about how they can make their jobs better and how to make their lives easier. I guarantee you there's going to be some, well, there's going to be some bad ideas that come out of that too. <laughs> but, but I think that's the creative process. It's sticky. It's messy. You throw stuff up, up on the wall and see what sticks. Um, but I think it's just this, again, moving beyond just this compliance centered, well, you, you come to work and you put in your clock, your hours and you do what you're paid to do. No, we can't, we don't do that anymore. Our competitors don't do that. Right. anymore. We're gonna lunch. <laughs> so it's, it's basically providing a platform in which you ask them to help and you provide them, you know, some incentive in which they can, uh, contribute to the company beyond just what they do. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not that it's not as hard as we want to make it out. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And we haven't asked. Uh, to be honest, I, we haven't asked. Exactly. And if we asked more, I think people will, would step up. Good, good. All right. Well, this is my next to the last question for you. All right. <laughs> um, is there anything um, that I didn't ask that you wish I would have asked? Something that you think might be good for our our listeners, the leaders that are listening to here? Oh, man. You know, I can't. Honestly, I can't think of anything. You've been really thorough. I honestly can't think of anything. Um, I know that, uh, you know, I, I think at times these things that we're talking about, I, I liked what you just said. These these topics, these strategies, te these techniques, we can sort of elevate them to the point where it becomes this, you know, mystical, oh, well, you need to do this or you need to incorporate this methodology or you need to read this book. And it's just like, well, no, I think you just need to start off with one thing. Do one thing. Do one thing a little bit better today than you did it yesterday. See what happens. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Good. All right. And so for my last question, um, on this, this journey that you've been on, this uh, leadership and helping others with their leadership abilities, um, what has been one or two pleasant surprises you've had along the way? Mm. Well, I, I don't know if this is a surprise, but let me, let me preface it by saying no one is immune. <laughs> so as I'm doing these uh, these workshops, like I said, I only do about 20 to 25 in a year. So I've been to uh, healthcare conferences. I've been to I've worked for I've worked with manufacturing companies, logistics companies. So I've I have a broad range. I have a I have a narrow topic, but I have a broad range of 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 audience. Um, and the reason why that is, is this plagues everybody. You know, we don't live in a um, in a, an economy where uh, one industry doesn't struggle with this. So I guess for me, it was more the realization that these are truths and um, sort of true isms that almost everybody can relate to. And then the other sort of, I guess, pleasant surprise is that I think people genuinely want to do a good job. Um, I, uh, in, I've heard this sort of management theory before. I think it's a management theory, but it's called the principal agency theory. And basically what that states is people want to do the least amount of work for the most amount of money. So that is the old sort of, uh, industrial age factory mentality where people clocked in and it was very dangerous work. And they were just trying to get away with the least amount of money and least wear and tear on their bodies for the most money. Mm -hmm. And that used to be true in the industrial economy. But now that we live in the information age and the knowledge economy, 
I don't think that's true at all. I think people want to genuinely do a good job and they want to make a contribution that matters. Um, so when that is, that is coupled with leaders who want to truly engage their people and are looking for ways to do it, um, I think that's the beginning of a really engaged workforce. And to me, that excites me. And I, um, you know, I can't solve every sort of bad boss employee relationship. <laughs> um, and I wish somebody would have been there to step in for me. Mm. Um, and actually there, there was, I ended up moving to a, a better department and it, it, it ended up being fine to be honest. And if I didn't want to go into teaching, I probably would have stayed at that bank. Um, so it goes to show you sort of this resiliency that employees can have. Mm. So one bad apple doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to lose them forever. Um, but if consistently, consistently you're not doing that, you're, you don't care if they're engaged or not. Um, you're going to attract those types of employees that don't care whether you're engaged or not. Wow. So, yeah. So to me, that was sort of the, the biggest light bulb moment, I guess. Very well, very well said. Very well. Drop the mic. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Phil, thanks again for uh, being willing to come on the podcast and, and share sure. your knowledge with us. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This was this great. This podcast was brought to you by Bigger Brains, online training that won't bore you to tears. Expand the minds of your workforce at getbiggerbrains.com. Thanks for tuning in to Permission to Speak. If you want to increase collaboration and innovation in your organization, check out more resources available at speakingpractically.com or give me a call, Kelly Vandiver, at 770-597-1108.